Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, and, and uh, Sanjay and the committee, uh, this is just wonderful. I can't tell you, uh, spending nearly a decade working at this, and, and, and this really seems like a, a great step uh, forward. Um, Aero Farms is a company that is devoted to building uh, uh, very large leafy green farms, and <clears throat> We, um, well, um, I'll be sharing with you the, the history and the state of the art and a little bit of proof of the particular approach that, that we have determined to take. And then the second part of this, I'd like to talk about the challenges, um, the potential full savings of, of the art of having aeroponics applied to growing leafy greens and um, some challenges that we have in recognition as, as an industry. So um, we began in, in 2003 with some, some ideas and a prototype and uh, struggled a little bit, but ended up with an aeroponic system growing in cloth and using high pressure sodium lighting. Um, in 2004, in the upper left corner there, uh, found a building in Marathon, uh, really good proof of concept, 1950s factory, moved into the basement and started uh, with about 3,000 square feet. And as all of you probably know, all the learning begins when you move from your little tiny prototype that you can take such great care of and you start with 3,000 square feet and then the problems um, begin. Um, you can see in the, on the upper right side, we built these three machines. They're double-deckers, um, so in a sense, they truly are. We're, we're, we have a vertical uh, growing system. They were about 100 feet long, um, and, um, and they had cloth in them. And at that time, I was sewing furrows into the cloth. So if you can imagine sewing 100 feet worth of cloth furrows. Um, we worked for a couple of years working out most of the bugs in this particular system and they were all the technical challenges. Um, I managed to sell most of that time and got great acceptance from the local restaurants and, and uh, grocers and <clears throat> um, that kind of kept me going as is the stuff that we were putting out was really very high quality. If you look at the bottom picture, we have now moved um, to uh, a, a much more sophisticated system. And that is thanks to uh, an investment of capital in 2009 from 21 Ventures. Uh, David Anthony thought that we were really the future of agriculture. He put some funds into the company. And we spent several years building equipment and creating uh, installations throughout the world. So we currently have about five farms um, and a sixth one uh, under construction, but we have our, the facility that you just saw in Marathon, New York, which we pretty much are using as an R&D facility, a 90,000 square foot facility uh, under construction in Chicago, and it's interesting, Chicago seems to be the, 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 the hotbed of, of what's going on. Um, and um, we have uh, a farm in Seattle where microgreens are what's being sold and uh, the quality is quite incredible. So the price is close to $60 a pound for the microgreens that are being purchased there. Um, and in Newark, New Jersey, we have uh, a farm that's, I think, the most local production you could possibly get. It's 30 feet from the salad bar. So in the cafeteria of a school, we have a farm growing. Um, they used to have it on the fourth floor and they moved it down to the cafeteria mostly because they wanted all of the kids and all of the teachers that are in that school to experience what it was like to have, a, have, a, have and see a, a, a farm. And then we have two international ones. Um, certainly had some technical challenges moving there. Using desalinated water means that you have to put everything back in in order to have plants stay happy. Our system is, is very simple. Um, you can see the, the uh, stacking here. It can go uh, to 20 feet high, perhaps even higher. Each one of those uh, layers has um, a, a spray system to spray the roots and keep them, uh, keep them moist and supply the nutrients. 
Uh, it has a cloth barrier that the, that the seeds are uh, placed on and, and they grow. And, um, and then lighting from above. And we move from the HPS that you saw on the double-deckers uh, to this, which have the distance. So one of the things that I think occasionally is not thought about is when you go to artificial lighting, you have a square distance function here. So the, the further you go away, the much less light that, that you have. So, um, <clears throat> but putting the, putting the lights very close like this allows us to maximize uh, the productivity and if you will, really does give us the third dimension of growing. We're a technologist at heart and have been uh, collaborating with Cornell University and with RPI's Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute's Lighting Research Center uh, to kind of look at how can we make the plants of, of much higher quality. So we've been checking out what can you do with lighting alone um, to influence flavonoid content. And Neil Matson, who's here in the audience, and, and myself are... Um, We'll soon have a paper published relative to flavonoid content and, and some, some other uh, interesting aspects of, of working with a system like this. And the uh, uh, Lighting Research Center put together the technology um, here. And we continue to do experimentation with uh, light intensity and some other attributes of getting the right photon to the plant just in time. In order to be a successful company, you have to have solutions. And one of the solutions is to keep the capex low. Um, here, repurposing buildings really helps us a great deal with doing that. So as you noticed, people are leasing the space on top of roofs, things like that. Can't really go into this with new construction or you end up with very large numbers as we saw in one speaker's presentation. You also have to meet the current price points. Um, so you have to figure out then how to take and lower the costs of, of doing things. And when we first started, the cost of uh, energy just to light the plants was well over half of our total input cost. Through doing some careful thinking and some research, we are now at 70, we've removed 70% of the high pressure sodium uh, light energy and uh, to, by using LEDs and a few other uh, aspects of things. Also, um, something I think that's ignored is you need to have very low shrink in this. And by shrink, I mean we've talked a little bit about waste, and I'll show you a slide in a little bit about that. But um, you want to be able to take, as, if you can, 100% of the crop and, and be able to sell it and, and not get any of it back. Um, from the people that you're selling it to. And the, the other aspect, of course, is, is that if you have investors, it's very important that you have attractive IRRs. And it's taken us quite a while to work through the systems, um, through the, the uh, input costs, uh, CapEx aspects of things, but we have quite attractive IRRs in this. And I think that's still going to be a struggle a bit for the industry. There's a few other things that I think are very helpful in terms of solutions, and they've been mentioned previously as well, but indoor with basic training. So um, you, you move the system indoors, and all of a sudden you've removed the, the dangerous drudgery, uh, uh, the, the dirty dangerous and drudgery, the three Ds that actually precipitated the initial use of robots in the very beginning. Uh, you take that out of agriculture and create something that's much better. In terms of food security, if you can now grow anywhere, anytime, you now really have an opportunity to put, put um, growing at the place where people want it. Food safety, I think, should be a good deal easier because as we increase the control of the system, our, our ability to, to implement HACCP and do the proper monitoring and meet, in a sense, I guess, in January, the Food Safety Monitor Modernization Act is going to impose a lot of things on current agriculture. I think we'll be in a much better position to address those. And with fertilizer in a closed system, we really now have 100% um, utilization of those nutrients. So we don't have an effluent. We're not contributing uh, pollution. Why did we select leafy greens? Um, first, they're very nutritious. We get about 22 crop turns a year. 
Our yields are very high, 30 pounds per square foot per, uh, per year. Um, lots of varieties. I think this is the most incredible thing. Um, our pallets, we get sick of foods. We want variety. And we have, I, I don't know, I've never tried to count up how many leafy types of leafy greens could actually be consumed. But there's a huge opportunity there. Um, currently, they have a very high value per pound, and it's rather interesting. If you watch what happens to other things, people say, well, a real high value crop, the price is going to come down. But the price has actually come down very slowly in, in, uh, in leafy greens. And uh, having, some, having pristine quality as a result of moving indoors means that you can maintain that value. So I guess to sort of to summarize um, Aero Farm's approach to things, we're, we're award-winning. Um, we have great proof of, of our technology by having people actually implementing it. Um, we have marketplace acceptance, having our products sold in all of these different grocers, most especially in, in Chicago. So now I'd like to move to the challenges, and here's one of them. I think that we have a real opportunity if we emphasize this, that we are part of the clean tech industry, if you will, because we are really reducing the amount of energy um, by getting most, if not all, of our product to market. And I think someone else, I think Jen mentioned that we lose half of, of our product just from seed to harvest, but look at how much more we lose. And that 76% loss is, as far as I'm concerned, unacceptable. Um, also, we have a real opportunity here to shift the, the water usage part of, of things. So if you look at the green bars, that's the, the uh, productivity. And um, the blue line is the amount of water used to achieve that productivity. And there's a huge difference there between conventional and what can be done with a stacked aeroponic system. Um, and so uh, if you think about it, California uses about 19% of the total state's electricity. And I think it's 30% of natural gas is used to move water and deal with water. That, to me, is almost mind-boggling. So it, if you were to go to the state of California, you should be able to make quite a good case for, um, for dealing with water-related issues. Um, and thirdly, there, um, there are some challenges, I think, in terms of, I might call that recognition. Um, not having a farm bill, I think, hurts everybody in agriculture. Um, the Food Safety Modernization Act um, really needs to happen um, because the number of recalls that we have in, in leafy greens is, is just incredible, mind-boggling. That needs to come to a stop or our consumer acceptance is, is, is going to falter. And hopefully this will help with removing some of the bad actors. Um, USDA programs are really aimed at rural so here we are, it's mostly rural farming that's going on and that's where the support is going, but we're really talking about urban farming. And so there needs to be a bit of a shift there. there the National uh, Agricultural Statistics Service, I've sent them several letters asking for a, the creation of some kind of a standard. So micro, baby, teenage, adult, I, I, I don't know. What, what, what is it? What, what are we buying? But to some degree, if you're going out and looking for funds, you have to be able to explain to investors what's the marketplace out there. What's the total available um, market uh, for something if they're going to invest? And they're looking for big numbers. And we right now have to make estimates based on Romaine, Ice Age, any of the other uh, lettuces that are out there. And um, lastly here, the USDA organic standard um, has not really kept up with technology, although I'm aware now that uh, the facility in Chicago, it appears that they have a little bit of an in and they've figured out a way to, to uh, be able to say that they're organic. But I would say all of this creates a very pristine product. And what's in the mind of the consumer when they think about organic is it's insecticide, herbicide, pesticide, whatever, whatever side you want to think of free, um, that it's hopefully safer. Um, and that it's kind to the, uh, to the environment. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to uh, share kind of what I've learned and what I view as, as the challenges. Thank you, Ed. Uh, very informative. Uh, any questions for Ed?
the way in the back here. Uh, you've already you've already put these things in schools. Are you looking at developing like a home product or <laughs> so everybody um, can grow right where they? Yes, uh, uh, there are some opportunities there. Um, I that's. If you will, that's the full disintermediation of the marketplace when next to your refrigerator is your farm. <laughs> um, hi. Yes. I have the second question. So um, why haven't you looked into California, I guess, if you've mentioned the big uh, water challenges that, you, that are? We are, but all companies need to stay focused in the beginning and work with what you have. And we have a real opportunity in Newark at this time, so that'll be um, that'll be our next focus area. Yes. <clears throat> it, it, so is your business model to sell the, the systems or to, or to be in the business of running the uh, facilities? To, own, to develop, own, and operate the farms. Okay. All right, so my question was the same. So this is all proprietary information. You're not... Uh, w uh, not going to be selling that to private individuals, the concept? Yes, there's probably some people in the room. We've been through three business models. So when I first started, all I wanted to do was fill all those factories that I saw along the sides of the interstate and put farms in there and maybe make a little money in the, in, in the process. Um, when, I, when the venture capitalist found us, his request was that we become the equipment provider. So we sold equipment and that's how we ended up with the farms that I, that I listed. Um, in uh, December, we merged with another company and reevaluated the best way for us to protect uh, intellectual property, the best presentation to investors, uh, many of the things that, that you need to in order to have a successful model and shifted back, in a sense, coming full circle to own and operate farms. Okay, so at this point forward, you're owning and operating farms. Yes. And so I'm a private individual. I won't have access to any of your uh, equipment or techniques and so forth. Correct. So um, it seems like leafy greens are kind of the. Um, oh, God, sorry, sorry. It seems like leafy greens are kind of the uh, go-to crop here for um, profitability. Do you have any rough estimate on how much the process would need to improve? The, the efficiency of the process would need to improve in order to move beyond um, just leafy greens. Um. I, my, my best guess, and this is just a real rough guess, is we would have to have, again, the energy and or find a, an equivalent somewhere else in the, um, in the, on the input side to make it extremely uh, attractive to move into, let's call them, much the commodity end of things. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's fairly simple. It's so many watts per pound, if you want to think about it. That's, that's one of the measurements that you have to have because it's a sizable thing that you're doing. And although everyone says the sun is free, it's really not free, but you're trying to substitute and, and come up with something that's equivalent. So I would say we might have to have the current um, slate of inputs in order to move into all the other uh, crops. Any other questions for Ed? Thank you very much. We're going to have a panel, so you Thank can you. ask more questions.